Earth. The surface of our planet is a heterogeneous mixture of life, chemicals, and inorganic materials like sediment, rock, and soil. Indeed, some of Earth's most significant features are its environmental gradients. When we step back and look at the Earth as a whole, we see that conditions change from one location to the next. Whether we are considering temperature, vegetation, precipitation, snowfall, or the chemistry of water and air, the conditions on our planet are not uniform. They vary from one environment to the next. In general, an environment is a portion of the Earth's surface that is physically, chemically, and biologically distinct from adjacent areas. Indeed, there are many variables that we can use to define an environment. Winds, waves, and water currents are some of the most basic features of an environment. The velocities and directions of these flows help to distinguish one environment from another. Fluid dynamics vary from environment to environment as well. So does the chemical composition of water and air. Climate and weather patterns are also important features of environments along with temperature, rainfall, snowfall, and humidity. And of course, organisms can also be defining features of environments. There are plenty of plants and animals that only inhabit one or a few types of environments on Earth. In this context, a chief concern in sedimentology and stratigraphy is the origin of sedimentary rock. Geologists want to know where rocks come from. In what environments did they form? Overall, Answering this question is a three-step process. Scientists first study the rock and examine its lithology, texture, fabric, composition, fossils, and sedimentary structures, looking for distinguishing characteristics related to the conditions under which it formed. They then explore modern environments on Earth today to better understand their conditions. What are the fluid dynamics of the environment? What agents of erosion are present? What is the climate like? And are there any specific kinds of organisms present? The scientists assess these options and then lastly use logic like deductive reasoning to deduce the environment in which the rock most likely formed given its characteristics. The whole process is based on the overarching idea called uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is the concept that all of the processes that apply to the world today have always operated on Earth and more broadly have operated throughout the universe. Our planet is now and has always been affected by certain natural laws and forces. Laws and forces like gravity and the processes of erosion caused by wind, moving water, and ice. These things exist on Earth today, so they must have also existed on Earth in the past. In other words, if you know the defining features of an environment on Earth today, then you can make some safe assumptions about environments that existed in the past and about the types of sedimentary rocks that formed in those environments as well. Now, before we go any further, we should probably recognize that not all environments produce sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks only form in environments 
where sediment is deposited as layers called strata. In some environments, however, there are flows of moving air or water that are simply too strong and powerful for deposition. Sediment grains are eroded and transported, but they do not accumulate as layers. This means sedimentary rocks only form in environments where there is more deposition than erosion. You can also think of it this way. The total amount of rock that forms in an environment during a given amount of time depends on the rates of sediment deposition and erosion. If sediment is eroded faster than it is deposited, there is a net loss of sediment and rock over time. Conversely, if it is deposited faster than it is eroded, there is a net gain of sediment and sedimentary rock over time. This explains differences in sedimentary environments. On Earth, environments of net erosion are typically found in terrestrial and non-marine areas. These environments commonly occur in large mountainous regions where weathering is intense and erosion happens quickly due to glaciers, mud flows, and flash floods. There are also environments of net erosion in the ocean, such as clift coastlines and submarine canyons, where water currents strip away sedimentary rocks and loose particles. There are also environments where there is neither deposition nor erosion. These areas are called non-depositional environments or equilibrium environments. And they tend to be located in the penny plains found in the interiors of continents. Penny plains are more or less level land surfaces produced by erosion over long periods of time when they are undisturbed by crustal movement. Simply put, penny planes are flat, so gravity can't assist with erosion or deposition. Penny planes located in the interiors of continents also tend to be very dry, so there isn't much water to help with erosion either. Because there is no net deposition or net erosion in the interior penny planes of Africa and Australia, these parts of the Earth's surface have been open to the sky for millions of years. That's why they often have this red soil. The soil has been intensely weathered by oxygen over time. Personally, I find this very fascinating, but let's return to sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks form in environments where there is net deposition over time. We refer to these sorts of environments as depositional environments, and there are many different types. The conditions that exist in these sedimentary environments affect the rocks that form there. The physical, chemical, and biological characteristics of a rock that are related to its depositional environment are called its facies. We usually break facies down further into a number of components. The lithophases of a rock refers to its texture, fabric, and sedimentary structures. If clasts are present in the rock as well, the surface features of the clasts are also considered part of the lithophases. Overall, the lithophases tells you about the transport of sediment, depositional process, and histories of weathering and diagenesis in the depositional environment where the rock formed. All of these characteristics tell us about the conditions that existed in the environment. If you have a sandstone that contains ripples, dunes, and cross stratification, 
then it means that there was flowing air or moving water in the depositional environment where the sand was deposited. If the grains in the sedimentary structures have surface texture called frosting, then we can go one step further and conclude that the rock was deposited in a depositional environment influenced by wind. We know this because ripples, dunes, cross stratification, and frosted grains are all created by wind. We can also consider the fossils in a rock. The biophases of a sedimentary rock refers to the organisms preserved as fossils within the sample. The organisms in an environment depend on climate, location, and the fluid dynamics and chemical conditions there. If a limestone contains bioclasts of seashells, then we can safely infer that those animals were present in the depositional environment and that the limestone itself must have formed in a marine setting because you can only find seashells in the ocean. Beyond body fossils, we can also consider trace fossils. The ichnophases of a rock is a description of its trace fossils, like its burrows, tracks, and trailways, and the environments in which they formed. Trace fossils can actually tell you more about a depositional environment than you might imagine. Simply being present, trace fossils tell you that conditions in the environment could support life forms that lived on and within the sediment. They can also help to identify the environment. Dinosaurs, for example, were terrestrial animals. They generally lived on land. So if you find a trace fossil of a dinosaur footprint, it means that that rock was deposited in a terrestrial environment, like a river or lake. Along these same lines, sea stars only live in the ocean. So again, if you find a trace fossil of a starfish, you can infer that the rock comes from an ocean environment. Amazingly, geologists are able to distinguish between many types of ichnophases and the environments in which they formed. In fact, there is a significant change in trace fossils going from shallow marine to deep ocean environments. So a few trace fossils can actually prove themselves to be very useful. In any case, facies receive names. Overall, the goal is to provide the shortest name that is still accurate and descriptive for a facies. You can either name a facies based off its defining characteristics, like its lithology or fossils, or alternatively, you can name facies based on the environments that they represent, whatever they may be. Indeed, you should be mindful that the same facies could be called multiple things. All of these labels here are acceptable names for facies. In principle, the concept of facies is a simple one, but there are some important nuances which are easy to overlook. And while facies analysis is sometimes very easy, other times it could be quite challenging. Consider this. Some types of organisms live in multiple environments. Snails, for example, live both on land and in the sea. Likewise, different processes can produce the same types of sedimentary structures. Both moving air and flowing water produce ripples. What this means is rocks of certain facies can actually form in multiple environments. Terrigitous mudstones, for example, are deposited in shallow lagoons located on the coastline, as well as in deep ocean environments. 
As a word of caution, you should consider all of the information, lithophases, biophases, and ichnophases. But don't overinterpret the data. Sometimes you can't ascribe aphases to just one depositional environment, and that's okay. Report what you know, narrow it down as best as you can, but don't overinterpret. It is also important to remember that conditions within environments change over time. Some changes are short lived, like weather patterns that develop and disperse over minutes or hours. Other changes last for months or years, like seasonal and climactic changes. These changes will affect the faces of the rocks that are deposited during those times. In this context, a geologist won't usually infer a depositional environment from simply one facies. They instead look for facies associations. Think of a facies association like the fingerprint of a depositional environment. It is a set of two or more facies which all form in the same depositional environment and can be found together in a stratigraphic succession. The goal in facies analysis is to find layer after layer after layer of facies all belonging to the same association. If you do this, you can then confidently identify the depositional environment and rule out alternatives. Lagoons aren't simply environments of terrigenous mudstone deposition. They also develop wave rippled sandstone lithofaces and terrestrial plant and animal biofaces. It is this combination of faces, this association, that allows us to recognize lagoonal deposits. It's not unusual either to find sequences of faces that repeat themselves over and over and over again. The order or sequence of faces in a sedimentary succession as well as its tendency to repeat itself, can be very useful observations that help to identify their environment. After all, there are various processes on Earth, like the rise and fall of tides, which are cyclical and repeat themselves and can affect the deposition of sediment. There's one last piece to the puzzle of rocks and environments. The locations of environments aren't static. They move over time. Rivers, for example, will suddenly change course, abandoning old channels and filling in new ones. In the process, one environment becomes another. With this in mind, it is important to think three-dimensionally and consider how environments grade into each other. For this purpose, we must think not in terms of environments, but in terms of depositional systems. A depositional system is a set of facies and environments that exist alongside each other, blend with one another over time, and become intermingled as sedimentary rock layers. We call them systems because their environments are interconnected with each other. In general, a system is any set of things that are interconnected with each other. In this sense, the different environments in each system share a number of things in common, sediment, physical processes, and organisms among others. Always remember that environments vary across both space and time. This is one of the most challenging aspects of sedimentary geology. It's something we will work on together over time.